right, good morning. Hope you'll grab your Bibles and get ready to turn. We're going to be looking at a lot of different passages of Scripture this morning. I got to tell you, I've not been this excited about preaching a series than the one that we just got out of, all right? Uh, I am, uh, every week it seems, you know, you go into your study, you think, where is this going? You get so excited and truly am uh, very excited to be talking about the core doctrines of our faith, what we believe and why it matters. And I want you to know we'll have some guests coming uh, to our Champions Campus during this series over these next eight weeks. It's going to allow me to get to our North Klein Campus and Jersey Village Campus And here's what I want to do as we kick this series off. I want to do an introductory message today. And the title of the message, I'm calling, Why Doctrine Matters. Now, I want to say up front, this is not going to be seminary-type lectures, okay? Uh, Nothing against seminary. I've been to a couple of them. What I do hope that happens uh, by the end of each message, by the end of this series, is that we will capture the motto of one of the seminaries that I went to that... Uh, said, we want knowledge on fire. Uh, We want to discover uh, what we believe and have confidence in what we believe, but we're going to spend a lot of time in these messages talking about why what we believe really matters. And so as we get going, let me uh, kind of briefly uh, set this up and explain where we're going today. I want to share with you three reasons why I believe a series like this, a series on doctrine is so very important and needed in our day. And then I'm gonna give you some expectations that uh, you can have as you come in over the next uh, eight weeks. We did this with our cultural series. We did Chasing Sanity just to kind of set the the table for where we're going. Want you to be fully aware of what you're gonna be getting into over these next eight weeks. And then I'll close the service out uh, by giving us five reasons uh, that doctrine matters. First, why is a series like this important? Why would we spend eight Sunday mornings on various doctrines that help define our faith. The first reason I wanna give is a personal reason. Uh, I am in my third year now uh, as your pastor, and I know uh, that there has been some change here over the last few years. Uh, There's been change, though, uh, before I got here. You had a wonderful pastor that led you for nearly 15 years, and he transitioned into another role, that's change. And then COVID hit, and you wanna talk about bringing change, my goodness, we had to stop meeting for a period of time, watched online, and we had to change uh, our our meeting times, and uh, we changed how you check kids in. It was change, change, and more change. When you came back, maybe you changed where you were sitting uh, in uh, the worship center. A lot of change. And then you call a new pastor, me. And like any new pastor who comes in, has a fresh vision, a new direction, a new focus. And I just want to take this opportunity. I I said this to our eight o'clock congregation. I said it in our 930 as well, and just say it to you. Uh, I am... uh, so grateful for how you have supported and embraced and encouraged uh, me uh, in this new season of our ministry. Uh, You have been so uh, faithful uh, just to offer up your prayers and support. Uh, When people ask me, how's it going at Champion Forest? I always tell them, man, I I feel like we're still on our honeymoon, right? I mean, you know, a a marriage between a pastor and people is like a marriage between a husband and and, and a spouse. And I just want to say, who wants to get off the honeymoon? Let's keep this thing going, all right? It's good. And so you've been uh, so uh, great in just uh, uh, being supportive of uh, the direction we're going. But a lot has changed. We brought on new staff. I think we've hired 13 Uh, new staff members over the last three years. Because of your generosity, uh, through our forward program, we have updated and upgraded nearly uh, every room and and, and structure in this uh, church. You can't walk these halls, uh, walk our campus without seeing a visual picture of the change that's taking place around here. And what I want to say in this is that change isn't bad. You know, there's a saying in the church that says uh, the last words of a dying church is, we never did it that way before, okay? Uh, We don't want to be a dying church. 
Uh, and so we do want to remain flexible in our programs and our ministries and events and how we do what we do. We want to do what's most effective. And oftentimes, the sign of decline that leads to a slow death in a congregation is a refusal to change. And so whether it's inside the church or outside the church, uh, we know that change is a part of life. It's been said that the only constant in life is change. And so a personal reason I wanted to do a series like this right now is because I wanted, as your pastor, to bring a series of messages to assure you that while we will be light on our feet as it relates to programs, events, and ministries, while we will constantly analyze and make sure that what we're doing as a church is most effective in accomplishing the mission of the church, while we will change what we do and how we do some things and maybe how things look, I wanted to preach a series of messages about what will never change as a church. And what will never change is what we believe as it relates to the core doctrines of our faith. If we cease believing the doctrine that we're gonna be unpacking in this series, then we cease being a true church. And so for very personal reason, I believe it's time for a series like this uh, for our church to assure you that in the midst of change, there are some things that will never, ever change. The most important things will never change. Secondly, it's time for a series like this for cultural reasons. Oh. We are no doubt seeing a moral decline in our country, and it's been going on uh, for years. And I believe that there is a strong correlation, believe this without a shadow of a doubt. I believe there is a strong correlation between the secular drift, the moral decline we find ourselves in as a culture, and an increase in impotent liberal churches led by pastors, and I put pastors in air quotes there, that have stopped preaching the whole counsel of God. And so, lost people, Lost people, people who don't have a personal relationship with God, people who don't believe in God, we cannot expect them to act or live in a way where they make personal decisions like we do as Christ followers. They are lost, they don't know God. And so we can't expect them to live under the same type of authority that we live under. However, we can expect and should expect a group of people that define themselves as a church, certainly those who carry the title pastor. We can and should expect that if they say they represent God, to represent him faithfully. And what we're seeing today, and we see this throughout history, and we've certainly seen it in the times of the Bible, you look at where more often than not, God blames the moral and spiritual decline of a people. It was typically laid at the feet of spiritual leaders who had neglected or forsaken truth. They were shepherds who were not feeding their sheep, but instead looking after themselves, not wanting to fend, giving itching ears what they wanted to hear. According to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the church of the living God, is a pillar and buttress of the truth. And so when a church begins to redefine truth, or when they decide to live by their own truth rather than living by and contending for and defending the faith once delivered, Jude verse three, is it any surprise that we see the moral laxity and ever increasing desire to live totally opposite from the way the creator God designed us to live? If the keeper of the truth, the church, is no longer holding to the truth, no longer anchored in the truth, no longer tethered to the truth, then of course, there's gonna be a sharp trajectory downward. And you just watch the news and you see it playing out 
right before our very eyes. You just look at what's taking place in the United Methodist Church right now. And I'm not picking on the United Methodist denomination. There are other denominations that have gone before them. But currently, right now, since 2019, 2,000 churches have disaffiliated from the United Methodist Church because of the church's stance on ordaining LGBTQ clergy in the blessing of same-sex marriage. 2,000 have disaffiliated. What's more concerning is the 25 plus thousand that haven't. So when the church moves away from the authority of scripture, we're gonna talk about that. That's a major doctrine of the church, the doctrine of the Bible. When you move away from God's word, anything goes. When a church moves away from the scripture that teaches us about God, theology proper, we're gonna talk about this next week, the study of God the Father, who is holy, holy, holy. When you move away from that truth, when you move away from what the Bible says about man being created in God's image, male and female, when you move away from the doctrine of sin, original sin, you move away from what scripture teaches about these things, then there will be no issue with same sex and LGBTQ lifestyles. And so where do you go to get a biblical worldview? If you don't go to the church, where are you going to go? Once the church untethers from the truth, anything goes. Once the salt container goes bad, the salt is bad. And our influence will be lost, our impact minimal, and it's exactly what we see playing out in our culture today. So do we need a series like this? You better believe we do. The timing is right, and it's now because, because, listen to this, right doctrine should lead to right living. What we believe matters because it should work itself in action. What we believe should affect the way that we behave. A third reason we're doing this series is because it's part of the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. The Great Commission, Jesus speaks, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Part of making disciples, which is a focused priority for us. We said we were gonna be laser focused on making disciples. Well, the very heart of making disciples, the Great Commission, is helping people to properly know and worship God. Making disciples is part of teaching people to observe all that Jesus commanded. And so in this doctrine series over the next eight weeks, we're going to see that Jesus affirmed and he helped build through his life and teaching these fundamental truths of our faith. That's the great commission, the great commandment. Mark chapter 12, verse 30, the first part, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your what? Mind. With all your mind. To love the Lord with all your mind means to grow in your knowledge of him. That's what theology is. Uh, Theology is a combination of two words. It simply means the study of God. Uh, The ESV study Bible gives this great definition. I thought it was worth bringing to you as it relates to theology. The study of theology is an effort to make definitive statements about God and his implications in an accurate coherent, relevant way based on God's self-revelations, which we find in his word. Doctrine equips people to fulfill their primary purpose, which is to glorify and delight in God through deep personal knowledge of him. Meaningful relationship with God is dependent on correct knowledge of him. Well said. So this series is very important because if God, the creator of the world, the one who spoke the world into existence simply by the power of his spoken voice, the one who knit you together in your mother's womb, who threw the stars in the sky and the scripture says knows them by name. If this creator God can be known, 
if he has made himself known, if he desires to be known, if that is true, then studying and growing in our knowledge of God, i.e. theology, it's not just for preachers, it's not just for academics, it's not just for theologians, it is for every person created by God. So there is a need for this series right now. Now very quickly, let me give you uh, some expectations, okay? First expectation as we meet here the next eight weeks is this. We will use the Bible as our true source as it relates to God in every doctrine we study. Um, when we talk about doctrine, where do we get doctrine from? It's God's word. And we're gonna talk about, in, one, in a, a week of this series, uh, we're gonna talk about why the Bible is trustworthy, how it came to be. Uh, we're going to talk about its veracity and how it's authoritative for life. I did a podcast this week with an author who just released a new book on hope, and he was talking to me about his book, and he asked me to just share with his audience why uh, we should tell Christians to go to God's word uh, to find hope. And we had a wonderful conversation on just what we're talking about right here, that God's word is trustworthy, uh, that you can lean on it in tough times. If God's worthy is not if God's word is not trustworthy, then why go to it? No need to. And so you can expect every single week when you come in, I want to encourage you uh, to come in and be ready to study God's word. Bring your Bible with you. It's a presupposition uh, that we are going to receive from this doctrine series. God's word is it's spoken in Hebrews 4, verse 12. It is alive and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit, joints and mirror, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. We're gonna believe Psalm chapter 119, verse 60, that says your word is the sum of all truth. And so when it comes to this series, we're basing it on the Bible. So bring your Bible. Secondly, we will only study what are considered major doctrines. This series is only eight weeks long. We had to cap it somewhere. Uh, and so we decided that we were just going to cover the fundamentals. Uh, we're studying only the essential doctrines of the faith. Uh, over these next eight weeks. Now, uh, the ESV Study Bible, which is the Bible I study from just in my own time alone with the Lord, they've got great articles in the back, and they gave this as a visual. I thought, man, this will be really good to show the church. And so I want to show you this bullseye on the screen right here as it relates to what we're going to cover in this series. We're, we're going, we're shooting for uh, right there in the middle, what we call the absolutes, okay? These are the essentials of the faith. So we're gonna cover doctrines like the doctrine of God the Father next week, what we call theology proper, that's an essential. We're gonna take the work of Christ and the Holy Spirit in one week and we're gonna talk about the Trinity, it's an essential. We're gonna talk about man and sin one week, it's an essential. Salvation, how is one saved? How can we know that we're saved? We're gonna talk about the Bible being God's word. We're gonna talk about the church, how is a church to be governed? What constitutes a church? Why do you do Lord's Supper and baptism? And then we're gonna talk about last things, the, the physical return of Christ. These are absolutes, these are essentials. They are major doctrines. Listen to what Wayne Grudem writes about the major doctrines in his systematic theology. He says this, a major doctrine is one that has significant impact on your thinking about other doctrines or that has significant impact on how we live the Christian life. A major doctrine is sometimes called first order doctrine. It's, it's an essential, an absolute. Well, Grudem says a minor doctrine, second, third order doctrine, is one that has very little impact on how we think about other doctrines and very little impact on how we live the Christian life. So going back to our bullseye target, let me explain how this is gonna work. We're gonna shoot for right there in the middle, the absolute. So let's take the doctrine of salvation, for instance. That is an absolute, that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And we're gonna talk about how one is saved when they, when they trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, that his blood atones for our sins. That's the doctrine of salvation. If you don't believe that, you are not a Christian. It's an absolute. Now, a conviction is what we believe about baptism. Uh, a conviction is, after one confesses Christ and professes Christ, a conviction is, for us, that someone should be water baptized. That's a conviction. Uh, that's something that we as Baptists rally around. It's a conviction that we share. We may mention some convictions, but that's not the focus of this series. Uh, then you have opinions and questions. 
And the lines can kind of blur on these two, but opinion would be uh, that uh, when someone trusts in Christ for salvation, the absolute, uh, the conviction may be that it's by immersion, but an opinion might be that they're not to be baptized until after they've gone through a new Christian's class and they've learned the basics of the faith and they know exactly what they're doing. Or another opinion would be, no way. The Ethiopian eunuch said, there's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he was baptized. You should be baptized right after you're saved. And so those opinions vary. A question would be this. When do we baptize by immersion? Do we baptize a four-year-old or a five-year-old or do we wait till they're six or they're seven? These are questions that we have. So we're not going to deal as much with convictions and opinions and questions. This series is gonna focus in on the absolutes. And let me say this about convictions and opinions and questions. We're not going to separate as it relates to Christian fellowship over a conviction or an opinion or a question. When it comes to absolutes, we will separate over that. We will fight over absolutes. Again, if you don't believe what we teach about the major doctrines, you are not a Christian and not a part of his church. And so the mindset that we have, the heart that we wanna have, it's been quoted, attributed to a number of people, let me give it to you, in essentials and absolutes, unity. We're rallying around these things. In non-essentials, in convictions, Liberty. In all things, opinions and questions, charity. And so if you're a believer in Christ and you embrace these absolutes, whether someone is Anglican or Catholic or Lutheran or non-denominational, if you believe the absolutes, you are family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. Another word for these absolutes, these essential doctrines, is what we call orthodoxy. Trevin Wax just wrote a great book called The Thrill of Orthodoxy. Listen to what he says. Orthodoxy, essentials, absolutes, refers to the foundational truths consistent with the scriptures upon which Christians through the ages have demonstrated agreement. Orthodoxy is the historic Christian consensus on the essential elements of true faith and practice, what has been believed everywhere, always, and by all. And so, this is where we're gonna focus, the major foundational truths of Scripture, what we call orthodoxy. Number three, expectation. I'm excited about this one. We will recite creeds and confessions that will help inform our faith and anchor us to historic Christianity. Now, man, I grew up Baptist. We didn't recite creeds and confessions, okay? We're a confessional people, but we didn't recite them. And so, just as a practice over these next eight weeks, at some point during the service, it might be in the call to worship, it might be before the preaching, it might be during the message, we're gonna recite some of these ancient creeds that the church has held on to, that they have recited, that the early church gave us. We're gonna recite a creed like Philippians 2, verses five through 11, which is just this Christocentric uh, passage of scripture that the early church would recite together just to remind them of the greatness and goodness that is in Jesus Christ. We're gonna look at the Apostles' Creed that was given to us in second century. We're gonna recite it and just Look at it and see what it says that the church universal has embraced as an official creed of the church. We're gonna look at the Nicene Creed, fourth century, 325. These creeds have been developed by uh, early church fathers to keep the church from heresy. They faithfully summarize and help articulate this faith once delivered. And so just as a practice in this series, just to anchor us to historic truth. We're going to recite some creeds and confessions. We'll look at the Baptist faith and message, some of the confessions of our faith that we believe, and we'll rally around it. And listen, we have 35 to 40 minutes in these messages, so what I'm asking for is a little grace, because we are not going to be able to cover everything that you perhaps would want us to cover. Now, as we bring this message to a close, wind down, fourth quarter, okay? It's the start of the fourth quarter. I want to give you five reasons that doctrine matters, all right? Number one 
is it is commanded we teach doctrine. You want to know why doctrine matters? Because as a pastor, as an elder, I have been commanded by God to teach the church doctrine. Titus chapter 2, verse 1, Paul writes to Titus, who's the leader there in Crete, and listen to what he says, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine, imperative. One of my main roles and responsibilities as the pastor, leader, elder in this church is to teach sound doctrine. I am not to just offer up my opinion, not to preach worldly wisdom, not to give good advice. I am commanded to teach sound doctrine that comes from the word of God. And so one of the reasons that doctrine matters is because God commanded pastors and teachers, you teach sound doctrine. Secondly, why doctrine matters is because doctrine can lead to salvation. First Timothy, Paul is writing Timothy, who's leading the church in Ephesus. And listen to what he says in chapter four, verse 16 of First Timothy. Keep a close watch on yourself, Timothy, and on your teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And so in a very real sense, what is happening this morning as we open up God's word, what's taking place right now in this moment, eternity in a very real sense is at stake. This is why I'm so grateful for those of you that email and say, how can I pray for you? I'm praying for you. I'll always take your prayer. Our pastors will always take your prayer because how we handle the word of God is so very important. James chapter three, verse one. If you teach in a life group, this goes for you as well. If you teach the word of God in BSF, it goes for you as well. We know as teachers, we will be held to a more strict judgment from God. And so how we teach and what we teach matters before God. There could be someone here this morning who's present here or watching online and salvation is on the line and preaching doctrine matters. The lost need to hear the doctrine of man and sin, that they are created in the image of God and there is this God-shaped hole in their heart that will remain empty until God fills it. That's the doctrine of man. They need to hear the doctrine of sin, that when you sin, you have an imputed unrighteousness. Sin is not something you simply do. Sin is a result of who you are. You have an imputed sin nature because of Adam's sin. It's the doctrine of sin and it separates you from God. They need to know the doctrine of of the father who loves you with an everlasting love and is calling you into a relationship with himself you need to know the doctrine of Jesus who went to the cross and died for your sins and was raised on the third day you need to know the doctrine of the Holy Spirit who according to the scripture is wooing you calling you to himself and so what the church needs more than anything is the word of God being taught Doctrine penetrating the depth of your souls. You don't need me, listen. You don't, you don't need me up here being clever, telling funny jokes. And I'm funny, all right, I'm funny. You don't need me up here giving you my opinion on what you're seeing in the news and everything that happens every single day, you don't need that. What you need, what I need, is sound teaching. Doctrine that according to Paul can save their soul for believers who are backsliding, who are away from God. It's doctrine rightly divided that can cause a U-turn and you coming back to God. Doctrine can lead to salvation. A third reason it's important is because doctrine builds up believers. Um, Titus chapter one, verse nine. He, the shepherd, the elder, must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. The, The point of this is to give instruction. The NIV says it like this. We should encourage with sound doctrine. Sound doctrine properly taught builds the church up. I mean, come on, isn't it true? There are many, let's be honest, that have a weak faith because we were raised in weak churches that never gave us meat to eat. They taught 
topics that weren't textual. It was messages that, again, itching ears wanted to hear, wanted to make you feel good, not offend. It was entertainment. And we never went deep into the doctrine of God that gives life. And I'm telling you, you go deep in this doctrine, it will give you life. Last Friday, getting ready for the Good Friday message, I'm studying and I'm going deep. I've been a Christ follower for nearly 30 years, been to two different seminaries, a Bible college, and I'm studying the cross of the Lord Jesus, going deep into atonement and salvation, just going as deep as I can. And I'm telling you, been a Christian all this time, and my heart starts to enlarge and fire in my body. I can't wait. It's Thursday. I was ready to preach. I had to call somebody and say, listen to this. You see what I'm seeing? Why? Because when we go deep into the doctrine of God, it, it, it gives life. There's fire that comes with it. We don't go deep into these doctrines just for knowledge's sake. We're not doing this to get smarter. The warning here is that, again, doctrine and doing always go together. I want you to think about it. Jesus' most harsh words in the New Testament were those who had all the knowledge of God, the Pharisees. They, they, they had heads big with knowledge, but their heart was cold. And that was Jesus' most harsh words when I was at Washington Baptist studying theology. Here I am, a preacher boy, and man, I'm doing biblical backgrounds, and I'm in New Testament, and I'm studying the early epistles of Paul and the latter epistles of Paul, and I'm working on my Greek languages, and I'm in all these theology classes, but I wasn't involved in a local church. Wasn't serving, wasn't using my spiritual gifts. And I could have had a conversation with you, and I could have told you about how Israel's civil war split the country into a, two different kingdoms, and I could have told you all the kings of those kingdoms, and I could have talked theology with you all day long. My head was big, but you know what? My heart was shrinking. Because I wasn't doing anything with what I was learning. Listen to J.I. Packer, his book, Knowing God, which I'm sure I'll quote throughout this series. He gives an admonition as it relates to gathering up mere knowledge of God. If we pursue theological knowledge for its own sake, it is bound to go bad on us. It will make us proud and conceited. This is what 1 Corinthians 8 teaches. Knowledge puffs up. There's a point to going deeper. The very greatness of the subject matter will intoxicate us and we shall come to think of ourselves as a cut above other Christians because our interest in it and our grasp of it. We're not taking a deep dive into these foundational truths to grow smarter. Uh, We want to grow in our knowledge of God, yes. But it should always equal growing in holiness and being more like God in our worship of him and our witness for him. And so the warning is, not to just believe something and there's no burning in our hearts. That's why we're gonna just talk about what we believe. We're gonna talk about what we believe and why it matters. Fourth, sound doctrine refutes heresy. Heresy is the opposite of orthodoxy. And so taking in sound doctrine, healthy doctrine, will keep us from listening to, believing in, and endorsing false teaching and false doctrine that is so prevalent today. Paul would call, in 1 Timothy, would call false teaching, what he calls heresy, he would equate it to being gangrene. It's diseased. It's mold. We're in Houston. It's mildew, all right? And it can spread. And it spreads fast. And only solid doctrine will combat false doctrine. This is why our our next generation ministries are so important, man. This is why we give and we do everything we can to work like crazy to make sure our children and our student ministries are taken care of because we want to provide environments where their minds are soaking in the truth of God's word. Uh, they're, 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 They're being confronted with different ideologies and philosophies of life. It's all over the media, it's on their phone, it's in their schools. And so where do they get sound doctrine? They better get it from the church, but check this, we're only here a couple of hours a week. Moms and dads, this is why you're the primary discipler in your home, this is why we're doing this series. Maybe give you some tools and instruments to, to invest in your children. You, you know how uh, when someone's studying counterfeit bills, how they know what 
It's genuine versus counterfeit. They don't study the counterfeit. They study what's genuine. So when they see a counterfeit, they know it's a counterfeit. And so we're doing this doctrine series so we can study what's genuine, what's real, so that when we hear something that doesn't sound right, we can check it through a filtering system called dogma, doctrine, orthodoxy. And we make sure we stay tethered to the truth. Fifth and finally, doctrine helps prevent people from drifting spiritually. 1 Timothy 6, 20 and 21, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. What's the deposit? The gospel of Jesus Christ and all that comes with it. Guard it. Avoid irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. We know them, don't they? Well, don't we? They were once here, once engaged. Something happens. Time goes by, they're no longer here. They no longer believe this stuff. They swerved from the faith. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, Paul tells Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Preach the word. From it, sound doctrine. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, and complete patience and teaching. Look at this. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. They swerve. They wonder. And you know what's interesting about wondering? It just happens. No one wakes up and says, tomorrow at two in the afternoon, I'm done with this faith thing. Not believing it anymore, not gonna live by it anymore. You know what happens? It's just a casual drift. It's like when me and my buddies used to go tubing in the Caddo River in Arkadelphia. We'd get that inner tube, we'd plop down in that inner tube, and you know what we'd do? We'd float down that river. We never once had to work. The current just took us. We just drifted. Studying and standing secure in doctrine. You have, this takes work. We don't, we don't fold our Bibles up and put it under our pillow and go to bed and wake up tomorrow with a heart filled with doctrine. It takes work to study these things, to give ourselves to these things. If we don't, the inevitable result will be a drift. And we see it all the time. If you don't want to drift, you have to be anchored to something. And what keeps us from drifting is anchoring ourselves to the faith once delivered. It's the doctrine that endures. So here's what I want you to do. For this series, I want you to come hungry. The Bible says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. I want you to come. I want you to take notes. I want you to engage with us in Scripture. I want you to, uh, I want you to, 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 to participate and lean in. Come hungry, because here's the deal. Doctrine is we go deep into it, man. It's like a buffet that never fills you up. You know what I'm talking about? Like, there's great buffets. Poncho's down in Humble. Amazing buffet. Raise the flag, all right, all day long, all right? I totally just ruined this sermon by a Poncho's illustration. Um, <laughs> Feasting on dogma, doctrines, not like ponchos. Ponchos, you're done raising the flag after about two times, all right? And you don't want to raise the flag for another month or two. But here, man, you come in, and I promise you come hungry. Pray for me as I prepare, and I, I, I pray under God. I'll bring you a meal that, that you can eat and feast on every single week. And the thing about the Word of God is the more you feast on it, the more hungry you get for it. it never fills you up. So I want you to come hungry. And I want you to come humbly. Because as we talk about these doctrines, when we come before God's word, we bow our hearts, our minds, and our wills to a truth that never, ever changes. Amen? Thank you for joining us online. We hope today's experience encouraged and challenged you. At Champion Forest, we are passionate about all kinds of people coming to know God, to grow in their relationship with Him and others, 
and then to go out and make a difference in the world. We would love the opportunity to talk and pray with you. To connect with us, just go to championforce.org slash connect. And hey, of course, we can't wait to welcome you on campus in person on one of our locations. We'll see you soon.